A very good afternoon to all of you. I am delighted to welcome you to the 21st edition of the World Sustainable Development Summit. My name is Monmi Barwa, and I'm the MC for this session, which is on reorienting market economics and accelerating development of green technologies for sustainable development goals. Uh, technology and innovation is at the heart of sustainable development. Innovations and technological solutions can help countries address their development needs along with accelerating their economic growth. Through this session, executive heads of various uh, business houses have come together to deliberate on how best can the society move from a market-based approach to an innovative base approach to develop green and clean technologies, taking a step closer to achieve the sustainable development goals. For this, the uh, session will be moderated by Mr. Chur uh, Mr. Manish Churasia, the Managing Director at Tata Clean uh, Tech Capital Limited. We welcome you, sir. We are also happy to have our distinguished line of speakers, uh, Dr. Maria Mentelis, uh, Chief Executive Officer at We Mean Business Coalition, Geneva, Switzerland, Mr. Hussein Al Mohammadi, Chief Executive Officer, Charger Research Technology and Innovation Park, Mr. Mahindra Singhi, Chief Executive Officer, Dalmia Simon Parak Limited, um, Mr. Rohit Chandra, Chief Executive Officer, OMC Power, Power Private Limited. Mr. Sunil Dukkar, Group Chief Executive Officer, Vedanta Limited. Uh, Mr. Alexander Steller, Deputy Managing Director, US India Business Council. And uh, Mr. Suman Sinha, Founder, Chairman, and CEO, Renew Power Private uh, Limited. I uh, now invite Mr. Manish Chavasya to kindly uh, conduct the proceedings of the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Monmi. And a very warm welcome to the esteemed audience. And today we are really lucky to have a very eminent panelist with us to discuss a very important and a pertinent topic, uh, which is uh, reorienting market economies and accelerating development of green technologies for sustainable development goals. As we all know, global warming is perhaps the worst uh, problem and the issue which uh, humankind has ever faced in our existence of over a million years. Now, this is completely a man-made problem and has been created over the last 150 years because of our obsession with growth. Now, growth is very good and it has led to a lot of advancements. Uh, it has led to a much better quality of life. But this growth has come by a lot of carbon emissions. And it has led to a situation where we have already used more than 90% of our carbon budget. Now, going forward, it will be impossible to grow the way we have grown in the past. That is by emission carbon dioxide. So what is the new model? Clearly, we have to find a model where our growth is decoupled from carbon emissions. Now, this is something which is very important and we have to reorient market economies. We have to find out new technologies for this to happen. A lot of progress has happened. Uh, technology has improved. If I go back 10 years, the cost of uh, solar power in India was about 20 rupees to a unit of power. Now it has come down to two rupees. As we speak, the cost of uh, battery storage is coming down by almost 10 to 15% per annum. The progress has happened. But unfortunately, if you add up all the progress, Plus, if you take all the commitments which have been made in COP26, even with the mind you, these are not, you know, these are not, uh, these are just uh, a statement of good intentions. These are not legally binding. And even if you add all these commitments, we are nowhere uh, within our target of uh, temperature rise uh, within two degrees centigrade. So clearly, a lot more needs to be done. And uh, without much ado, now let me just uh, request our uh, panelists. To, uh, to discuss more about this topic. The way we are organizing this panel discussion is that we have got four very pertinent questions, which I will put on the screen. And I'll request uh, each of the panelists to give their views on one or more such, uh, more or one or more such uh, questions. And after that, we will have a second round of questions. So the questions which we would like to discuss are right here. So what I would request panelists to talk about is, first, in what way 
the private sector contributes in all the stages in terms of initiation, experimentation, demonstration, commercialization, and diffusion of green technologies for public goods. What are the various strategies and approaches that can be adopted to reorient market economies to focus on innovative green technologies to attain sustainable development goals? What policy signals are needed? How can green technologies be made affordable and accessible to all? How can all the stages of green technology development be de-risked? So these are some very important and pertinent questions. I will now request each of the panelists to give their views on this. And uh, uh, we will start with uh, uh, Ms., uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Alexander Stater. Mr. Alexander, please. Hi, thanks so much for uh, inviting me here today. I apologize, I had an issue with, with taking my uh, computer off of mute. Um, let me just say that I wanna say thank you to uh, the Energy and Resources Institute for inviting me to take part in this year's World Sustainable Development Summit. Uh, as a former World Bank official, I take seriously our obligation to deliver sustainable and inclusive growth and job creation. Uh, it's a moral obligation as much as an economic uh, imperative. This is how we preserve the planet for future generations and allow everyone to take part in uh, the prosperity that's generated from economic growth. Uh, it's an honor to be involved uh, in Terry's robust efforts to advance his agenda and take part uh, in the critical conversations that take place at the summit. Um, I'm also grateful to be part of such a distinguished group of co-panelists uh, the second year in a row um, that I'm here at the, the summit uh, doing this. Uh, for example, it's nice to see my friend, Mr. Singhi, uh, the CEO of Dalmia Cement. Uh, he and I took part in a closed door uh, roundtable last April with Special Presidential Envoy uh, Kerry on ways the US and India could cooperate in promoting the development of green technologies. So very much in line with the conversation that we're having here today. Uh, Mr. Singhi is a leader uh, in aiming to decarbonize one of the most carbon intensive sectors of the economy. Um, uh, cement and, and building materials. So uh, it's great to see you, Mr. Singhi. Uh, I'm also grateful to be here with two leaders of the green technology ecosystem in India, uh, Tata and Adani, uh, both of whom are world leaders in the production of renewable energy, uh, which is the foundation of any and all efforts to reduce the carbon intensity of economic growth and job creation, uh, as well as achieving the goal of keeping global temperatures from rising above the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. Uh, both Tata and Adani are valued members of the organization that I help lead, the U.S. India Business Council. Uh, they sit on our global board. Uh, the head of Tata Power also joined that roundtable with Secretary Kerry last April, uh, and both companies use their membership in USIBC to advance the, their significant contributions to India's achievement of its robust renewable energy targets under the Paris Agreement. I know that both will be important to partners for meeting India's Glasgow targets uh, when, on renewable energy and reducing the carbon intensity of its economic activity by almost half by 2030. Uh, as Secretary Kerry reminds us, it's what we do by 2030 that is most critical to tackling climate change. Uh, the organization that I represent, uh, USIBC, helps promote a stronger U.S.-India partnership through broader and deeper trade investment ties between our two countries. We're at the forefront of shaping the bilateral economic relationship, and as I said in the summit last year, are all in when it comes to tackling climate change and reducing the carbon intensity of economic growth. Our sustainability working group brings together corporate members from across multiple sectors to promote policies and initiatives to achieve these goals. Uh, so we really are committed to uh, helping promote innovation in this sector uh, and deliver the technologies that innovation creates at affordable prices. Um, USIBC is an international fleet of the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, a highly influential advocacy group in the US uh, on economic issues including trade and investment. Like my organization, USIBC, the Chamber's members represent some of the world's most innovative companies uh, that, based on experience, work through the Chamber to promote policies that build ecosystems that generate innovation, which is what we're here to focus on today. Ultimately, innovation is about experimentation, creativity, risk, and failure. Um, these are things that, for a variety of reasons, many of them valid, are difficult for large government bureaucracies to undertake. Uh, especially these days with significant scrutiny applied to government's work, uh, scrutiny that is critical to protect the public interest and keep our constitutional commitments. As a result, innovation these days comes largely from the educational and private sectors uh, with critical incentives and commitments from government supporting their work. 
Uh, I might add that it also comes from global collaborations that promote the exchange of ideas and knowledge sharing. Uh, I think there's a lot we can learn in promoting innovation in the green technology sector by looking at how we've had success in building this ecosystem in other um, sectors, specifically digital uh, and biotechnology. So the US approach to doing this um, is that government has a role to play in the early stages of innovation. But industrial policy is not the way to go, uh, as the market is a better arbiter of competitive companies and technologies than government. So the US government, for example, in um, the defense space has an organization called the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the Pentagon. Uh, and in the biomedical area has the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Uh, these agencies oversee basic and applied research grants to academia um, that are made on a global basis, not merely to American companies. Uh, this helps promote uh, crowd in ideas from the, the best companies in the world, um, whatever their sources, and allows the applications that are generated from them to have um, applicability beyond the U.S. context. Um, there's also a need to create ecosystems of innovation. Uh, so take a look at Silicon Valley, right? There you have um, a wonderful research institution in terms of Stanford, you have NASA, um, uh, and all kinds of companies and human capacity uh, in the area that creates um, uh, lots of innovation clusters uh, uh, that help de deliver the products that, we, that are basically shaping our lives every day in the technology area. Um, you have similar sectors in the biotechnology arena in terms of Boston uh, and the Research Triangle in North Carolina, which has three major universities. Uh, we also need to make sure that there's uh, adequate funding for startups. Uh, and this too can come from, from the government, but we also see it coming from um, you know, private equity firms and venture capital firms these days. Um, so the idea is to sort of create demonstration cases where uh, these entities and generate returns that they're looking for uh, from uh, investments in green technology. Um, ultimately, the private sector uh, provides post-startup funding as well as collaborations with academic institutions to supercharge ecosystems. Um, you have Indian companies doing this in some ways already. Uh, for example, Tata has made available $25 billion uh, to promote uh, digital technology collaborations at universities like Harvard, Yale, and IIT Madras. Uh, and breakthrough technologies. Um, the government then needs to make sure that whatever is produced from this ecosystem has a market, right? So it basically sets out the uh, types of procurement that it's going to undertake um, and not condition this on it coming from American companies, but merely just be the best technologies. Notably, when it comes to green technologies, we actually have a marketplace for this being created already by the private sector, um, with many companies already committed to, to be private, uh, sorry, carbon neutral um, by 2030. Uh, these are major consumers of renewable energy like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, um, or uh, 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 logistics companies like UPS, uh, or those that are manufacturers of uh, electronic goods like Apple. Um, so this type of um, uh, ecosystem is already well along its way when it comes to green technologies. Um, which also brings me to my final point. The kind of innovation solutions that we need um, that are applicable globally are ones that take place in a world of uh, open uh, communication and, and open information exchange and integrated economies. Uh, and this is where I'll sound a note of caution. During COVID times, a lot of the economic approaches that have gained currency cut against this kind of uh, open, innovative ecosystem. In both the US and India, for example, there's talk of onshoring, localization, self-sufficiency, and stronger border controls. This approach is not one that enhances innovation on a global scale, no matter the sector. So as we think about how we want to do this for green technologies, um, I think there is a typology that we can follow in other sectors, um, and uh, we should try and build that um, uh, for green technology. And again, there's, uh, we're already ahead of the game in some ways because the private sector is already making commitments um, to provide the demand for the new technologies once they come uh, to, uh, uh, to fruition. Um, but again, we have to guard against closing our borders, uh, whether it's to people or goods or the exchange of ideas. Um, otherwise, we're not going to get the innovation that we need. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Very pertinent points on innovation and the fact that whatever we have to do, we have to do by 2030. I now request Ms. Maria Mendeluz, CEO of We Mean Business Collision, 
to come in. Thank you, Manish. Thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be today with you. I'm not going to repeat, uh, you know, what we have said about the honor uh, of being with such esteemed leaders on the panel today. I'm going to just dive into, into the questions you have asked, Manish. Sure. So, climate crisis uh, that the world is facing today is, is intrinsically linked to our broader sustainability challenges, covering the 17 SDG goals. And for these reasons, climate neutrality can only become a reality if it touches all parts of society and our economy. This requires, as a president speaker has said, collaboration between all stakeholders, government, business, research, and civil society, both nationally and internationally. This is, um, it's just not like a nice word. We need unprecedented collaboration to be able to have emissions by 2030. This is not something that one industry can do by themselves or that a very smart uh, think tank can uh, figure out. This is something that requires all of us to work together. The Women Business Coalition works on the nexus between business and government. So, related to your first questions, business can demonstrate climate leadership by doing four things. First thing is setting a very clear ambitions to be net zero as early as possible and to have emissions by 2030. This is not an easy task, but, um, but the, the situation requires some. We need to take action. These are our, our four A's. Take concrete action to reduce emissions, including through green technologies. We need to be accountable. Report on progress against targets in a complete and transparent way. The scrutiny is out there. Businesses are facing every day some um, suggestions that they are greenwashing. The only way to, to respond to those is for being transparent and reporting progress. And finally, advocacy. Business need to be proactive in advocating for ambitious climate policies aligned with 1.5. We guide business towards climate leadership and leverage leadership by more than 2,800 big companies around the world and more than 3,500 SMEs. And there are three ways in which we work to that help accelerate the five phases of technological development, initiation, experimentation, demonstration, commercialization, and finally diffusion. First, we drive demand for new technologies. Through the Climate Group and in collaboration with others, we work for companies to commit to 100% renewable power to the RE100 100% of electric vehicles through EV100 and to commit to energy efficiency in factories, buildings and other operations through EP100. We are now setting a steel zero and concrete zero. These are two demand campaigns for companies to demand zero emission steel, zero emissions concrete, including activities in India. And these programs send demand signals for green technologies, which make it easier for technology suppliers, financiers, governments and others to invest too. So the demand is very important. In any other business, we hear it. The consumer is the one that drives market change. Second, we advocate for ambitious policy. A few little business can be enough to encourage governments to set more ambitious policy. This in turn gets more business to take climate action, which gives government more confidence to strengthen climate policies and so on. We call this the policy business ambition loop. And this loop uh, works. And this address the question, your fourth question. How can we de-risk investment? Well, we can de-risk and there are really good examples. Let me, let me talk to you about EVs. So EVs are in an S-curve, which means that after a long and slow start, all of a sudden we see an exponential uptake of electric vehicles. In actual fact, worldwide electric vehicle sales have increased by 41% since 2015. Most of electric vehicles are coming down rapidly and over the vehicle lifetime are starting to beat vehicles with an internal combustion engine. For electric vehicles to scale, we need good infrastructure and for that we need government to take the lead. In India, our partner, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, led the India EV campaign last year. And they issued some policy guidelines and an EV ambition statement. 
with 30 companies uh, that were advocating to accelerate EV deployment. In January 2022, this year, the Ministry of Power issued an EV charging infrastructure guidelines, which included some of the recommendations that the, these companies have put forward, covering timelines for public charging systems, access to electricity, charging locations, and revenue sharing. So clear timelines and policies can de-risk investments in clean technologies. And um, there are plenty of examples in other sectors, but I thought I will mention that. I mean, I'm not going to get into the detail around the, the value of carbon pricing as the best mechanism to rearrange the markets. There are some interesting examples in that respect, in, in for example, in the cement industry. And maybe Mr. Singhi will, will talk. So, as you know, um, the cement industry was not included as part of the emission trading system in, in Europe. But uh, when it was included, suddenly there was a lot of innovation that happened, which led to this sector. Well, let me be honest, the only company and leader that has always been 100% fighting climate since 2013, 2014 has been Mahendra Singh. Okay, but now the other companies are coming. Okay, because they had this price sign signal, and well, I'm sure uh, Mahendra will talk more about this. But the reality is that carbon pricing has helped this industry think that actually it makes business sense to reduce emissions, and actually they are advocating for carbon pricing to be included in other ge uh, geographies. So let me come back to my third and last point. A women business also help mainstream action across value chains, which is possible if we have both leading business and leading government uh, working to bring tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers to reduce em emissions. Um, we did set up the SME Climate Hub that provides SMEs with a one-stop shop to set 1.5 aligned climate targets and they can join the Race to Zero from the UN and access free best-in-class tools set up uh, for them uh, to implement their action plans. Uh, in India, 86 companies have already joined the SME Climate Act. And Tech Mahindra is one of the 12 multinationals that, as a 1.5 supply chain leader, works proactively with SMEs in its value chain. We are planning to launch the SME Climate Hub in India later this year together with India leading industry associations, corporate and civil societies, amongst others, because we believe that it's important that Indian SMEs join the journey and we don't left behind. So to your third question, Madis, about affordability, I believe that capacity building helps companies understand where can they find solutions that reduce cost and reduce emissions. And the SME Climate Hub gives education and tools for them. And while there might be some specificities by geographies, I believe there are some basic solutions, and we have a great panelist that will talk about them, that can apply to all business across geographies, such as energy efficiency or renewable energy. And let me conclude just with a few thoughts around the G20. As you know, India will host the G20 in 2023, and this is a unique opportunity to put green technologies, affordability, and the questions that we're talking today on the international political and business agenda. So last year, the Women Business Coalition sent a letter to the G20 with 800 global business, including 15 Indian companies, such as Reliance, Wipro, Godress, and um, of course, Mahindra Sinki as well. And this letter urged G20 leaders to strengthen NDCs, accelerate the energy transition, and align finance with a 1.5 future. We would welcome and would be very keen to collaborate with Indian government and business to prepare for an ambitious G20 agenda. And um, we hope we can continue the discussions. Of course, next year, this event will be really pertinent. There's a lot of work to be done that starts today when you lead G20, and we'll be happy to partner with you in doing so. Thank you, Manish. Uh, excellent, uh, Ms. Maria. Thank you so much. Very pertinent points, very important points. Uh, global warming is a global problem requiring global solution, and all parts of the society and economy have to be involved. Uh, with this, may I now invite uh, Mr. 
Hussain Al Mahmoudi, CEO of Sharjah Research Technology and Innovation Park, uh, to uh, come in with his speech. Mr. Hussain. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mahesh, for uh, this uh, amazing opportunity. I would like to start first of all by thanking Terry for uh, giving us at uh, the Sharjah Research and Technology Park to be part of this esteemed uh, guest. It's my first time to participate uh, in this uh, webinar and in this program, and I'm very delighted to really uh, be part of this partnership that we just uh, recently signed with Terry, uh, 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 a global reputed organization that hopefully together we will be able to cement the relationship between the United Arab Emirates and India, especially focused on uh, technology, innovation, education, an area that uh, we haven't done much uh, in our partnership. So for me, this is really an honor to be part of this uh, panel and, 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 and meet all of you uh, virtually, but hopefully one day uh, physically. I uh, uh, like to say maybe a couple of words about my organization, which is a government organization, Sharjah Research and Technology Park, is a, as a, as a UAE government uh, initiative designed to accelerate the innovation ecosystem in the UAE. Uh, the country just celebrated 50 years. We are going uh, into the next 50 years with uh, innovation uh, sits at the heart of our strategy. Uh, the government launched different initiatives, uh, a leading initiative which focuses on uh, sustainability and green technology, of course, Masdar, which is a global investor in the area of uh, green technology and solar and, and other, but also other organizations uh, in Dubai, like the Dubai Future Foundation. The Sharjah Research and Technology Park is another uh, uh, initiative that focuses on mainly four things. The first one, the development of the innovation ecosystem, uh, both hard infrastructure in terms of buildings and labs, uh, and also soft infrastructure in terms of funds, policies, legislation, etc. The second objective is to develop human capital, which are entrepreneurs, scientists, innovators. A third objective is to develop technology, so that's identifying and, 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 and commercializing intellectual property for our local universities, but also global universities and institutions. And last but not least, venture building and venture designing. The bottom line, we want to create companies and enterprises that will create economic impact and create jobs and opportunities for the nation. Uh, the park focuses on six main areas. It focuses on uh, uh, environmental technologies. It focuses on transport and logistics, uh, digitization, production design and architecture, energy technology, and water technology. Now, I would like to go Back to the questions, my, my colleagues earlier, I think they've did a fantastic job in, in explaining the, 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 the concept of the role of the private sector vis-a-vis -vis government and maybe academia. And I will probably share with you maybe since uh, this is my first time and I'm sure just to uh, bring a, a different perspective, just a case in our, what we are doing here in the UAE. Uh, of course, we are very proud of our relationship with India in many fronts and it says this is a historic relationship that we are very proud of and we take very dearly uh, close to our heart and this is going in the future to go bigger and better uh, in the future inshallah so the role of the private sector of course is key and in, in the uaE we look at the government as a, 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 an in, a, as a sector that lay out the overall umbrella on how 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 they would like to see the countries uh, developed they created uh, 2030 and 2050 innovation uh, strategy and under this innovation strategy different uh, players plays different role the private sector of course in the uae plays a strong role in bringing innovation into to the table and they do these things in different ways of course some of the areas that of course in terms of you know supporting education institutions and in developing skills and, and and students and different research activity that support the local needs Another is in, in, in the format of demonstrating, as, as we speak, for example, we have here in the park a, 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 a research uh, uh, 
uh, and development center that is developed by the private sector focused on agriculture technology and on renewable energy and we also work with the private sector in terms of commercialization of technologies uh, we, we we have different type of technology related to hydrogen to also concrete technology that maybe uh, mr uh, mandra would be interested to talk to, to us about it but we are developing uh, different uh, technology related to also uh, the, the concrete uh, technology so the private sector i believe it plays a big role uh, and, and it's also an evolving role because i think it depends there's no one size fits all i think the requirement of the private sector in india might be very from the requirement here in the UAE vis-a-vis -vis other places. So in, in the UAE, the private sector works hand in hand with the government to move the 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 the, the agenda of sustainability uh, and uh, let's say green economy forward. Uh, in terms of uh, reorienting uh, the, 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 the strategies for the sustainable development goals, I think the government plays a big role. The UAE government always take a leading role in, in, in this and I think uh, we will be hosting COP28 uh, 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 next year. They we pledged to have a, a, a net zero uh, country also. So that's, I think, a big agenda that, that, that the government uh, uh, set. And we mobilize both the private sector, government, and academia, and non-for-profit organization to really uh, support the overall government. So I think, I think in terms of reorienting markets, I think it is something that happens in partnership with private sector but i believe the role of government is key on creating direction for the private sector and the academia to to to, to come in and uh, uh, how do we make uh, uh, technology accessible of course uh, uh, for whatever reason in different parts of the world one of the challenges i think with introducing new technology is the cost of deploying these technologies and again, there is no one size fits all, but I think it's our duty, uh, uh, for example, here at the park, uh, 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 to facilitate and convince the government and the various stakeholders to come up with, with a model that allow new technology to flourish and to, uh, to grow. And of course, uh, different technologies require different uh, uh, approach. Uh, there is no one, 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 one model, but in Sharjah, at least, we do this cases by cases. So the framework that we develop, for example, for additive manufacturing would be different than the framework we do for concrete technology or hydrogen or water. Or so we look at each industries and we look at the supply chain of this industry and we design things specifically for those uh, industry with the hope that we will have the most efficient, effective model that will allow these technologies to, to flourish. And uh, uh, how we we de-risk again? I think I think that's an, another area for any uh, nation and government to really play a big role here because uh, technologies and development of technologies is, is it, it has a lot of risks. A lot of them are, are are research activities that need to be commercialized. And I think government and institutions like us are designed to to de-risk as much as we can the 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 the, the uh, uh, let's say the the new opportunities that come up come out so 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 that's that's really my 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 intro i would uh, uh, maybe uh, highlight uh, one element which uh, was mentioned by uh, my two colleagues uh, I, I think the role of education the role of education i know we we talk about it but it's 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 very critical because it all come up back to education and 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 the, the 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 best we do with creating future generation future champions future scientists and future society the better we will be able to address all of these uh, uh, challenges co co collectively so with this note i again like to thank everyone and and, and uh, uh, i look forward to listening to to, to to the rest of the speaker thank you I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Hussein. It's really great to know the pioneering work being done by UAE uh, in the field of green technologies through public-private partnership. Very impressive. Uh, thank you so much.
and may I now invite uh, Mr. Sunil Duggal, Group Chief Executive Officer, Vedanta Group, to come in, please. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, thanks uh, for giving me the chance to speak. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, very happy to listen to the views of the global leaders who are present on the call today. And uh, uh, from this call, I think uh, we'll evolve better human beings, of course, but uh, the direction we will set for our own organization and the country we live in could be better after this. I'm also very happy to inform you that uh, today uh, on this Terry platform that uh, we have signed a MOU with Terry to collaborate on ESG initiative and efforts uh, for the next 10 years. And we have set up a separate fund at Vedanta where uh, on some of the issues of our organization and the our intention and their capability could marry together wherein you know we will uh, bring in a lot of uh, initiatives on the table for Terry to add value to us and I believe that uh, uh, Vedanta will emerge stronger and find many solutions for uh, our uh, pillars which we have defined at Vedanta that uh, uh, we want to keep society, planet, uh, and people at the core of our business decisions. So I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, some of the uh, questions which you have asked, I would like to present my views on the table. I am a bit mindful of the time because there are other speakers who have to speak after me and uh, there is a time limitation. Uh, I would uh, not repeat on some of the things which I have said, but uh, uh, Everybody knows, and some of you also have said that uh, uh, the climate or the existence of this planet in this universe is a shared responsibility. And whether the mankind would become a extinct animal at some point of time going forward, and the time is not far off. Uh, we have realized that uh, the, uh, the problem is knocking at the door, and that is why there is a heightened focus which is being given and uh, the every citizen of this world has become mindful of uh, his or her responsibility. So in that direction, uh, corporate, government, individuals, NGOs, research institutes have their own responsibility and everybody will have to contribute. And until we col collaborate, uh, probably we will not be where we want to be. On the end result and the end objective, uh, we have a vision. We we want to make this world carbon neutral. And somebody said that we have already eaten away 90% of our quota of CO2, which could uh, we could afford to generate only 10% is left. And we be, we may not have the answer for everything uh, as on today. Uh, of course, some progress on some of the initiatives have happened, uh, but enough is not there and enough solutions are not there on the table for all that we want to do. So in that direction, I think uh, uh, the collaboration beyond our organization boundary, country boundary or uh, the continent boundary has to be realized. So uh, we have also been talking that uh, the, uh, the, the developed countries probably also have to uh, earmarks of certain funds for the countries which are developing uh, and the flow of fund across the boundaries have to take place and this is also an opportunity for us to reduce the discrimination and difference between the haves and have nots. So in that direction, <clears throat> everybody knows that huge funding is required, huge resources are required and we have to be uh, mindful uh, about this. So in that direction, uh, uh, I think uh, a lot is being done by various uh, countries. Uh, people have made the declaration voluntary. Somebody said that I want to be 
uh, carbon neutral by 2040, somebody said by 50, and somebody said 70. Of course, we may not have the answer for everything uh, as of now, but the intention is 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 there. Similarly, the organization have also volunteered uh, to make the announcement that this is the direction we want to go. And I am very happy to listen from all of you that the kind of effort in terms of technology development and long term uh, view is being taken. The uh, capacity building uh, of everyone. So we at Vedanta have also realized that uh, we should build the capability and the knowledge and the consciousness of every employee and the society around. And we have decided to set up a ESG Academy in that direction. We want to partner with uh, Terry or some of the other institutes where we would get help from them to produce the uh, training of trainers concept where we would produce. So this is also one way because the every individual who lives in this society or this world will have to contribute in some or the other manner. So in that direction, I think uh, the education and the consciousness and the responsibility of any human being of this world is extremely important. How can we lay down the ecosystem uh, around that? And how do we realize the responsibility as the countries, as the provinces, as the organization, as the society, as the NGOs, that how to bring the consciousness of every human being. As far as uh, uh, the organizations are concerned, from my viewpoint, uh, uh, while the intention has been laid, and uh, we have also declared uh, to the outside world that uh, how do we want to commit and what do we want to commit? How do you can monitor us? So what, what will be our scorecard? Uh, what we will deliver in the next one year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, if we will be able to make that commitment, a long-term commitment is one that the countries are saying that uh, 2050 or 2070 will become carbon neutral. But what is that exactly we will be doing? It will also throw a pressure on the organization and the stakeholders that what exactly they are supposed to do. And they will become more conscious of designing themselves better like uh, uh, in some of the organization i have seen that they make a rolling business plan of three to five years they take a long-term viewpoint of what they will do this year to ensure that the delivery three years down the line on our vision or uh, on our growth on our uh, sustainability how this will be delivered so it will also require a little longer term of detailed strategy planning viewpoint in the organization that what do we want to do and exactly how this will come somebody said that uh, the uh, the renewable power cost over the years have reduced uh, to one tenth of what it was 10 years back and similarly it is being talked that uh, in the hydrogen uh, fuel uh, we will have to reduce the cost to say one third, one fourth of what it is today to make it more sustainable and uh, the affordable fuel. I think uh, the when the responsibility uh, in this world has been realized by the organizations and the societies, the answers have always come. It is basically the intention which is more important. Uh, if we look at you know, the, the cost of talking on the phone or the cost of phone or the cost of the, uh, the data. Uh, so how much and how we have traveled over the years, these are some of the examples, but if the intentions are there, if the planning is there, if the collaboration is there, if a, if a, if a word, the word is treated more like a village, uh, where the where the support to each other would come, all these technologies will definitely bring the result. I'm very happy that uh, this year uh, government has declared a lot of policies uh, as a part of the budget where they said that how do they want to 
support the industry and the efforts uh, of the individuals and the organization that how they can support the effort that, by way of which the uh, their effort of reducing the carbon footprint could come be it in the form of supporting the ev vehicle building the infrastructure or uh, uh, the pli scheme they, they had declared the uh, production link incentive scheme for some of the sector very happy that uh, they have come up with uh, certain scheme so all those declaration are welcome step and i am sure that all the countries in the world are going in the same direction where they are becoming conscious that how they have to support the ecosystem to uh, where the efforts of the individual could be uh, could be could be realized supported uh, and people take more effort but i think more to think in that direction i mean uh, one of the example i would say that the transmission of black power uh, and the uh, green power cannot be compared though so government will have to come out with the policies which are more supportive create the infrastructure like uh, somebody said that the charging infrastructure but the transmission infrastructure from one part of the world to the another part of the world, one part of the country to the another part of the country how uh, the trans uh, the transmission or transportation transportation of the uh, hydrogen or the green hydrogen uh, will take place from uh, one part of the geography to the another part of the geography so a broader thinking has to be uh, required where uh, some more uh, supportive uh, behavior or the supportive policies of the government can come up apart from that if i talk of my own sector and if i uh, would uh, look at how the current world is look, looking like uh, the world is becoming more mineral intensive compared to the energy intensive it was uh, like ev vehicle requires seven to eight times more minerals than the usual uh, vehicle uh, the one megawatt power plant uh, power uh, power capacity setup uh, which is renewable required eight to ten ten times more mineral compared to a usual thermal based power plant so the world is becoming more mineral intensive uh, we also need a lot of minerals like cobalt copper uh, lithium uh, other minerals which are very very important from the point of view uh, of supporting the uh, renewable energy or the decarbonization of this world uh, as we are speaking the uh, commodity prices are crossing uh, the roof and uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult for people to uh, to to build their uh, renewable energy capacities going forward and we have to be literally mindful and so the in that direction one is uh, that the government has to build a conducive environment and the policies where the cyclic economy could be encouraged uh, the mineral exploration could be encouraged uh, the policies around the cyclic economy could be developed uh, and the government would encourage the uh, efforts of research of the organization uh, i I was also looking at the data around the globe where the percentage of GDP uh, spent on the uh, R&D activity, and especially now on the uh, decarbonization effort. Uh, there is a lot of benchmarking which could be done by India or some of the other countries. They can learn what are the efforts other countries or other organizations, big organization in the world are doing and how we could support those R&D activities where uh, the uh, technology is going forward could become more uh, more uh, efficient, more affordable and uh, what role we have to play. But we have to be literally mindful that uh, if the world will become more million intensive, uh, what natural resource sector like ours have to play a role. Uh, uh, and how we have to collaborate the 
government and we i mean the it is not only what we do inside our organization on various effort what i said but beyond that how we have to also collaborate with the government and teach them that what is important for the uh, for the world going forward we may also do the benchmarking uh, mm -hmm. educate the educate the policy makers that this is what the benchmarking around the globe is there this is how the policies could be tweaked how this is how the supportive policies in the direction of decarbonization could be made so i will have to stop here otherwise my colleagues will not get more time i i wanted to express some more views but uh, i i would stop here thanks for giving me the chance look forward to partner with you and speak to you more often going forward thank you very much thank you so much mr sunil luggal and many congratulations on uh, terry this mo you have signed with terry on esg collaboration and all the very best for the esg academy i think it's a very good initiative you made some very uh, important points you know uh, the green technologies are mineral intensive so how do we ensure that we innovate uh, with collaboration with the government and private sector uh, so that we we actually start uh, making our economy circular uh, a very important point and of course uh, the government has to come out with proper policies and there has to be collaboration with the private sector to really make green technologies uh, go ahead so that uh, we all can innovate very important points uh, may i now invite mr rohit chandra ceo of omc power to give his presentation uh, hi manish thank you very much and thank you to terry and all the organizers uh, for giving us an opportunity to speak uh let me start with a very brief introduction uh, i'm uh, the co-founder and ceo for omc power and uh, we are a 10 year old company working uh, in the rural landscape i would uh, like to uh, describe ourselves as a, a innovative uh, business model uh, you know driving uh, a sustainable way of developing uh, rural uh, landscapes uh, uh if you look at uh, our company uh, and you know the experiences that we've had over the over the last decade uh, of working uh, you know in the kind of uh, uh, rural frontiers uh, i would say that uh, we've tried to figure out uh, a model using uh, you know renewable technologies which could be self sustaining uh, and uh, which could provide the required a uh, growth to rural india rural africa or other parts of rural asia uh, in terms of uh, our uh, our 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 project and company we are a indo japanese uh, partnership uh, we are very proud uh, of our association with mitsui uh, and uh, and we are uh, uh, fueled by private capital so this is uh, a, 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 a a company which has uh, uh been fueled by by private capital and has and the business model has been built uh with the mindset uh, of delivering returns to investors uh which is uh, quite different uh, you know compared to the traditional outlook uh, and that's where i think use of renewable technologies and sustainability is extremely important for us uh, uh you know the what output do we deliver uh, in terms of the output that we deliver you know i would broadly say it's in three dimensions first is the economic dimension in the economic dimension we develop uh, you know a, a productive use of energy uh, in the rural context uh, which uh, which allows for uh, you know a great deal of entrepreneurship uh, you know jobs and employment opportunities uh, in rural india uh, we've helped uh, uh, you know a lot on the social dimension uh, whereby you know we we helped uh, harden Uh, the health infrastructure and especially very relevant in the last two years with with covid uh, and requirements for you know for uh, you know health health support all across the country uh, we've helped in education and uh, in areas like women safety and women empowerment uh, thirdly i think uh, uh, i would like to say that uh, you know our company of course uh, uh, is is net positive uh, so unlike uh, uh, what we hear uh that uh, that of course uh, the country is committed to be you know 50% uh, you know by by 2030 and net zero by 2070 the world is committed to 
get to uh, net zero by 20, say 50. Uh, unlike that, we are net positive uh, from day one. Uh, we, we, we ensure that uh, the use of fossil fuel uh, at the rural level, both domestically by small and medium enterprises and uh, uh, by, you know, uh, by uh, anchor loads uh, is, is uh, either, uh, you know, diminished or completely eliminated. Uh, we also ensure uh, that uh, generation is is RE based uh, and and uh, uh, and also trigger and facilitate uh, EV deployment uh, in 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 the rural landscape. Uh, you know we have currently uh, you know a model of development which we call the ABC model. Uh, and another unique thing that we have uh, you know done with the model is to make it all inclusive. Uh, when we operate in a certain village, we make sure that uh, we have something for every segment in the village. So the poorest person in the village can avail of our services for as low as say one, one and a half dollars a month. And uh, and of course, the, the richest man in the village, uh, which in our case uh, is, is the anchor customer, which is the telecommunication tower, uh, can also avail our service. So we've developed an all-inclusive model, which is sustainable, uh, and is based on you know uh, economic viability uh, and private capital. Uh, in terms of the footprint that uh, that we already have experimented with, we are present in uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we 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 are present in almost 15 districts of Uttar Pradesh with 270 power plants, uh, uh, running a distribution network of almost 500 kilometers, and we generate and and store and supply. 26 megawatt hours of, of energy every day uh, to all the segments of the market. Uh, now, a few words on technology and our expect experimentation with technology and how technologies could be, and especially renewable technologies could be deployed for public good uh, and uh, you know in models which are uh, which are scalable uh, and sustainable. So we our view on technology has been that look. Uh, we have enough risk in our business, so we are not going to take a technology risk. Uh, we are going to bet on technologies which are mature and technologies which which help us uh, produce uh, uh, a kilowatt hour of power at the low, lowest possible cost at a given point of time. So that's that's our view on technology. On top of that, we'd like technologies to to be ruggedized in nature so that they can be deployed in tough rural environments. Uh, uh, and can work well in tough rural environments. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, we believe that uh, the technology verticals that we, that we trigger, uh, if you look at generation, we use a mix of uh, solar, uh, micro wind, uh, and uh, we we is going to start deploying CNG. And uh, we have we have taken a mandate internally that in the next 36 months, uh, uh, we will completely eliminate any use of fossil fuel for generation within our company. Uh, in terms of storage, we, we, we like to bet on technologies which are, uh, which are going to provide uh, uh, fast charge and which are going to be maintenance free. So we are kind of technology agnostic as long as you know, it's fast charge, it's maintenance free, uh, and it can be you know, supported in tough environments, uh, operating environments. Uh, we are good with such storage technologies. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, in terms of uh, distribution, uh, we use smart, uh, innovative uh, grid structures, which are which can be compared to a prepaid mobile telephony service. So, you know, a lot of the learnings from the from success in another industry, which we believe did it really well, the telecommunication industry, uh, and a lot of those learnings we brought into the energy sector in this kind of bottoms up model that that we run. And uh, and we believe that uh, technologies, uh, you know, can can really help solve this large scale problem that we have. Uh, finally, I would like to say uh, that uh, the last bit on technology that we have uh, experimented with very successfully, that our learnings over the last decade have now been codified into what we call business process automation. So whatever were the business processes running across the company be it related to operation maintenance, be it related to rollout of new plants, be it related to sales and marketing uh, or, or remote monitoring of our systems and, and uh, you know, our plants and machinery. Uh, we have codified all the learnings. We have made sure that 
They are converted into smart applications which can run on iOS devices, Android phones, uh, you know, Windows-based computers, and can be used across, uh, you know, the board by our, our employees. Uh, and this ensures uniform service de delivery across, uh, you know, across our geographical spread. Uh, it, it, it makes the company, you know, uh, kind of uh, free of, you know, any risk of employee iterations, etc., and you know, ensures that you know uniform business processes are delivered across the board. Now, moving a little bit towards the future, uh, you know, I, I I'm conscious of time and would like to say that uh, you know, uh, what are the enablers for growth? The enablers for growth, in our view, are not policies and regulations now, because the government has done a great job in terms of providing a fantastic operating environment to companies like ours. Uh, we've had great experience and we believe that uh, there is enough, you know, policies and regulations out there to help us, uh, you know, do our job. Uh, what is required from our point of view is, is a large deployment of uh, developmental capital. I still feel that, uh, uh, you know, developmental capital is still uh, in the more conventional mindset uh, and what is required is for the developing countries to, I think, uh, uh, really accelerate the deployment of large scale developmental capital in business models that have proven that they are sustainable and ready to scale. Now, uh, my last point today is, is on what the future holds. Uh, and here I would like to say that, uh, you know, I think Manish and many of the speakers before me spoke about the, the climate emergency spoke about COP26 and the fact that the world today recognizes that we face a climate emergency. I think recognition of the problem is half, half the problem solved, right? And now, the, and, and this has happened because of how we have developed, you know, uh, our infrastructure, how we have perceived growth uh, in the cities in the last 100 years. Now, the unique opportunity that we have, and I think all stakeholders have, is how do we want to develop uh, rural India, rural Asia, rural Africa? Are we, going, uh, are we going to follow the same trajectory of development that we followed for our cities? Or are we going to do something different so that while developing rural uh, India, we actually make sure that the models that are put up for development of rural India or rural Africa are such models which are at least carbon neutral from day one or carbon positive so that 50 years from now we're not sitting here in a forum like this and trying to solve the problem and please remember 70 percent of india is rural right if not more so with this i would like to end uh, my presentation manish and very happy to take any questions that come come my way later thank you mr rohit chandra uh, wonderful uh, points fabulous sorry, points. Please interrupt mr uh, manish we can wrap up in uh, time because uh, we are already running out of time we are four minutes uh, late so maybe we can wrap up in very quickly okay we'll, we'll quickly wrap up uh, fine so uh, uh, many congratulations on the great work you are doing on the rural landscape and uh, you know you have made some very good points regarding development capital maybe policies and regulations are in place but we need development capital uh, we are short of time, so uh, I'll, uh, without any much ado, let me just invite Mr. Suman Sinha, who is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Renew Power, uh, for his uh, presentation. Mr. Suman Sinha, please. Yeah, thank you, Manish. Uh, I'm sorry my video is off because I'm actually uh, driving right now. Um, you know, uh, look, I think the, the points that you all have made uh, already cover a lot of ground. We all know um, the climate emergency is real, it's imminent, it's something that we have to deal with right now. And if we this particular decade uh, to bend the trajectory significantly downwards, then we would have lost the, we would have, we essentially would have lost the opportunity. And therefore we have to do what we can do right now. And so there is, uh, it's not just a question of therefore uh, doing things, uh, it's a question of doing them as quickly as possible, as rapidly as possible and doing them at, 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 at massive scale because the problem is intense, the problem is immense, and if we don't deal with the problem at scale immediately, then we will not again be successful. Uh, and so therefore, what are the obligations on us? Now, you know, companies like us, for example, which are renewable energy companies, we are already doing our bit in terms of trying to decarbonize the electricity sector as, as 
rapidly as possible. And we are working very closely with governments in our respective countries, which are also similarly minded to try to decarbonize the electricity sector as rapidly as possible. And their cost solutions are now available, technology solutions are available, such that the decarbonization of the electricity sector certainly looks quite visible now. It, it looks like it is doable and it can happen by 2030. Uh, you know, we'll be well on that in that direction. The issue, however, is the other areas. The other areas being the hard to abate sector. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Singhi, if he hasn't already spoken, will talk about it. Uh, you know, Mr. Sunil Duggal spoke about his sector. Those are critical sectors. If, if, if sectors like steel, cement, uh, mining and minerals, uh, aviation, transportation, if those don't also similarly look at decarbonizing themselves very rapidly, then we will have missed the boat. Now, now is enough being done? To my mind, not yet. And to my mind, what I see happening still is a lot of lip service uh, and less action. There are only very few companies like uh, Mr. Singhi's company which are actually doing what needs to be done. Most companies are talking about it, but they're still not moving fast enough. Similarly, if you look at the whole area of capital providing, if you look at the financial uh, world, the financial world, again, is talking about investing in ESG, but when it comes to actually putting their money where their mouth is, unfortunately, they tend to back away. And I think if you, if you see what's happening globally in the market right now, all clean tech stocks are selling off. Uh, by, and they've all sold up by 50, 60%. And, that, and this is globally well-recognized stock. So it tells me that ultimately, there is not enough uh, seriousness behind this area. Uh, it is still a very commercially driven area. And if people don't see commercial value, unfortunately, they will not come into the sector. Now, therefore, we need to make this whole area a lot more commercially viable. And that is where government policy needs to come in. It needs to come in in the area of coming up with the pricing for carbon. If people don't realize that they have to pay for carbon usage, they will just carry on emitting carbon into the atmosphere, and it's not going to cost them anything. So we need to have a price on carbon. We need to have much more robust interventions on the technology front and then using those technologies at scale. But again, for which we need mandates. We need mandates for things like green hydrogen and so on, um, uh, as well to come in so that we can decarbonize the transportation sector and so that we can decarbonize the, um, the hard to abate sector. So I think we really need to collectively get a move on in a lot of these areas. Uh, we, of course, as a company, we have now uh, close to 8 gigawatts of commission capacity we generate 1% or 1.5% of India's total electricity production. We help mitigate almost half a percent of India's total carbon emissions. So we are doing our bit as much as we can. Uh, but we need to really make this a much more broader civil society movement. And we need to make it a much more central activity for the government as a whole. So let me stop here because you've already been told to that time is short. So, so let me just stop here and then and, and give it back to you, Manish. Thank you. Thanks, Amad. Thanks, Amad. Very pertinent points. You know, a lot has been done as far as decarbonization of power is concerned, but a lot more needs to be done. And uh, clearly, government will have to come out with supportive policies. And clearly, we'll have to push new technologies. Thank you so much. And wonderful job being done by Renew. Congratulations for that. Thank May you. I now invite uh, Mr. Mahendra Singhi, CEO of uh, Dalmia Cement Bharat Limited. We have heard a lot about what he's doing already. And over to you, Mr. Uh, Mahendra. Thanks, Manish. Uh, my compliments to Terry for organizing such a great discussions on resilient planet for which we all are working so that we can uh, deliver a better world, better future to our uh, grandchildren. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, I have been uh, I've been able to get the wisdom of all my previous speakers so that, you know, uh, I may uh, speak less but uh, learn more. So thanks to uh, the friends uh, who spoke so well and have highlighted what needs to be done by private sector, by others also. So first I would like to say that the role which a private sector can play is how to reorient mindset, reorient strategies for green world through green technologies. I think that will be very, very important. And once you are able to reset your strategies, then definitely all green essence would start coming and this is what uh, we could do in Dalmia cement and as early as, as in 2018 we could visualize the future that what the future needs from us
from the hard to abate sector like cement and we could identify certain levers on account of which you know we can be uh, first uh, carbon neutral and then carbon negative and we have also laid down that by each every uh, five year what would be the carbon footprints and the first job which was done which should be done by private sector is to assess your carbon footprints and then to plan out that how you would be bringing down your carbon footprints and for that you may have to create some business philosophy the way a dalma cement could create a business philosophy which augurs well with the commercial nature of private sector is uh, clean and green is profitable and sustainable and you know these uh, business philosophies these strategies could make dalma cement uh, the one of the lowest carbon footprint cement company in global cement world now important is that whatever the levers are there for by which you can bring down your carbon footprint green technology is required and uh, mr manish you have highlighted uh, very important uh, four questions uh, on which if people start thinking about i think they will be able to make greener world so for that in my view green technology hub has to be created so that there can be a seamless transfer of uh, green technology to whichever company want to implement that normally that doesn't happen and even today also there is a hindrance of utilizing green technology even by various companies even even in developing world so what in industry can do is they can come out with their uh, uh, actions they can come out with their projects but until and unless like my other friends have said uh, green climate fund is made available capital green capital is made available various such projects various such green technologies cannot be implemented so the whole world has to now think how they can create certain demonstration projects in developing world so that the green technologies which are right for uh, bringing down co2 emissions which are uh, right for moving towards uh, net zero carbon road map that, that is there so one take out from this uh, conference should be that how climate Uh, fund or the green capital would flow to developing world and this is uh, one request otherwise you know like uh, various uh, efforts which have been done by mr alexander uh, madam maria mr husain which has suggested that how you can create collaborations and how we can create initiative also and the way dalmia cement has been working on the hard to abate cement sector is to explore now and to create a demonstration project of carbon capture and utilization so once such project is uh, demonstrated then definitely it will be easier for others to follow the suit and for that you have to show leadership also but at the same time you have to have the clean fund also secondly the new technologies which are further emerging like uh, uh, green hydrogen or uh, like electrification of the Uh, equipment etc for that dalmia cement is already committed but the important is how we can have collaboration with the developed world like uh, you know uh, bill gates uh, breakthrough energy or the breakthrough technologies which have been discussed in cop 26 so how we can take it forward so for for us it will be very important that if we have to inculcate the philosophy of a green world and green technology is that scale has to go up the scale of green technology has to go up and like my friends have said that uh, uh, more the volume uh, the lower the cost of the technology like the solar uh, energy or like the led bulb or many other things also so we are looking towards one executing the project as well also sharing with the world that what we are going so we have already started uh, sharing since last 3 4 years uh, in our integrated report that what's my carbon footprint and what's my target for uh, future years and i'll compliment mr sunil lugal for now uh, having mou with tari uh, so that the road map for esg or road map for various sustainable future can be created and this is how i think we will be able to achieve sdgs by uh, 2030 i finally because of shortage of time i would 
like to complete one by complimenting all the friends who have spoken here but at the same time the message is that if we are able to prove in our own organization that clean and green is profitable and sustainable then the pace of implementing green technologies will go in a faster mode and this green technologies uh, will be the great source for green world so thanks manish and thanks all friends and my all com compliments fabulous fabulous point you know and dalmia cement has led by example that what can be sustainable can also be profitable and this is the message which you have clearly given to the world and you have made an excellent point that it is about innovation it is about technologies but it is also about transfer of capital from the developed world where all the savings are there to the developing countries which need those capital excellent thank you so much uh, mr singh so uh, with this we uh, come to the end of the panel discussion it would have been great had we had time for the second round of questions but we really don't have time so uh, just to summarize we have had a great discussion you know uh, clearly what came out was that uh, global warming is a global challenge and it has to be addressed only through global collaboration innovations are extremely important uh, and we have to keep thinking about how to uh, innovate further and to create grounds for innovation at the same time we have to ensure that there is a transfer of capital from the developed world to the developing countries and at the same time we have to ensure that we have our policies in place and we start doing things at scale uh, while till now we have done a lot when it comes to decarbonization of power but lot more needs to be done when it comes to hard to abate industries uh, so uh, you know this is a challenge to all of us all segments of the society are involved and uh, and clearly this is the emergency time and all of us will have to play a very important role in fighting this war against global warming thank you so much thank you thanks everyone thank you bye bye thank you thank you bye and thanks everyone thank you thank you in half of Terry and the music is secretary we want to thank all the distinguished speakers and uh, for such an inf insightful discussion we would also like to thank uh, mr manish chaurasia for moderating the session uh, stay tuned the next plen plenary is scheduled in 12 minutes that is at 2 30 from now and you can visit the wsds uh, platform uh, the uh, website for the agendas so thank you all again. Thank you. Stay tuned, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.